robots will create winners and losers. People sit in that meeting crying, think they was going to have a job. And my generation in this town is, there is no future for us here. The people who will be most affected are not the people uh, with power. But you have a segment of America that's so angry, that's so left behind, that's so ignorant, that you know, they're, fe they're feeding all of this hatred and this anger. This is a tale of two Americas, the one that collapsed and the one that's about to. The manufacturing decline caused the hollowing out of the American heartland, but the big question now is, what cities will automation destroy? Many of the cities expected to be hit the hardest have the feel of a boom town, but that will change as automated vehicles, service robotics, and artificial intelligence displace jobs by the millions. Las Vegas is the very place where we expect the highest amount of jobs at risk to being automated away by robots and drones and artificial intelligence. That's Johannes Monius, a professor of business who has been studying where automation is going to hit the hardest. Some of those jobs are high paying, like loan officers and paralegals, while others are classic blue collar professions like security guards and drivers. Johannes took those studies and looked at which American cities could be most affected by automation. He found that 65% of the jobs in Las Vegas could technically be automated in the coming decade. What people don't understand is that the effect of automation will be much more profound than the effects of international trade. Johannes was in town to present his findings at an economic forum. He didn't have good news. It's a hard message to deliver because today, Vegas is doing relatively well. The case scenario is a social unrest, you know, that's, um, and I, I'm actually expecting that this will happen, no matter what. Um, it's hard to predict where it's going to happen. Part of the reason Vegas is prone to automation is the high number of service jobs. And though few expect all jobs to be replaced, a few robots are already working. They'll come up to me when I'm like on the floor and they're like, are you a robot? I'm like, no, not yet. <laughs> At this point, the robot is more of a gimmick than a replacement of a worker, but it's a glimpse of what's coming. Well, my name is Jeremy Bagby. I'm a technician here for the robots. I uh, monitor them whenever I'm here, make sure they're running properly. Many in the tech world argue that advancements will create more jobs, and Jeremy serves as one of those examples. Like at least as far as our bar goes, there's not really that threat of automation. They're nowhere near being as good as an actual bartender. And I think that when they established this place, the idea was, hey, look at this, look at this robot bar. That's pretty cool. Look at the robots making you drink. It's kind of cute. Look at them. They shake it. That's cool. No one's going to want to talk to a robot. <laughs> Until they have a personality, of course, then we'll see. I actually ordered a uh, Cosmopolitan because I knew it was going to have like some shaking and stuff like that to go ahead and see some of the cool stuff. And what do you think? Um, it was strong. Automation is already making steady gains in Las Vegas. Nevada's casino employment peaked in 2001 at 59,908. By 2016, it had dropped to less than 41,000. It's not just the strip. Jobs on the outskirts of the city are at risk in call centers, loan offices, and restaurants. In 10 years, Las Vegas could look like America's Rust Belt does today. Now look at them and say, hey, do you know that your job specifically has a probability of more than 90% of being gone a couple of years down the road? The manufacturing collapse hit hundreds of towns with endless rounds of layoffs and factory closures that gutted the middle class in the American heartland. The numbers of manufacturing jobs that are lost, especially in the Rust Belt, we're losing companies, it's, it's unbelievable, one after another, just one after another. We've been through technological change before, just not at this pace. The first industrial revolution started in the late 1700s with the mechanical loom, while the second brought things like mass production, assembly lines, and electricity. The third was defined by computers and the beginning of automation in manufacturing. Job displacement in this fourth industrial revolution is already underway as automated vehicles, drones, robots, and artificial intelligence are all coming online. My name is Brenda Battle, and I worked at United Technology Carrier for 25 years. 
they replaced a human with a robot. Naturally, there was a lot of kinks at first and the process of learning how to run it properly. But I got used to it. Brenda's factory became a major political symbol in 2016 when President-elect Trump came to the factory and promised to save jobs. But deep down, a lot of people knew he wasn't going to save our jobs. Trump met with the CEO of Carrier and announced that they had reached an agreement. Because they're not leaving this country. They're not going to leave this country. And the workers are going to keep their jobs. The former leader of the local steel workers union, Chuck Jones, literally did not believe what he was hearing. I'm sitting here thinking, the lying son of a bitch. Trump attacked Chuck on Twitter, but Trump exaggerated the number of jobs staying in Minneapolis. After the announcement, CNBC's Jim Cramer interviewed Carrier's CEO. We're going to make a $16 million investment in that factory in Indianapolis to automate, to drive the cost down so that we can continue to be competitive. What that ultimately means is there will be fewer jobs. Automation is well underway, and its effects are so severe that some economists are already calling it the Great Displacement. 85% of the manufacturing jobs lost during the first decade of the century were due to technological change, not to international trade. The effects seen in manufacturing are set to spread to other industries. 25 people were employed for every $1 million of manufacturing in the 1980s. Today, just five workers are needed for the same output. Galesburg, Illinois became the political poster child for the manufacturing collapse after a Maytag refrigerator plant moved to Mexico in 2004. Hello, Galesburg! The town was a vibrant symbol of American success for decades. I'm Richard Lindstrom. Uh, we're a 92-year-old business started by my grandfather. Lindstrom's is the store that sold those Maytag refrigerators on Main Street. We struggled as a downtown to try to keep, keep those customers still coming here. Our population probably has shrunk maybe 10 to 15 percent uh, from its high, its high point in the, in the mid-60s. Now, Galesburg is representative of America's Main Street that still hasn't fully bounced back, more than a decade after big manufacturing left. Technology and global competition, they're not going away. Those old days aren't coming back. As the refrigerator ran by these people who were working on it, they signed their names. So is your name on here somewhere? Well, I'm here. There we go, Mike Patrick. I wanted to see what the empty factories of the Rust Belt could tell me about what's coming for the towns that empty from automation. So what was it like when the plant closed? Well, it was, such, it was such a helpless feeling. A former union man in Galesburg, Mike Patrick, told me that automation has been a concern for decades and that the Maytag plant steadily required fewer workers as a result. When they shut down, we had, uh, in the plant, we had around 1,600 people running the same production that we would have been running when we had uh, 4,000. After plant closures, young workers were often able to find new occupations, while older workers retired or struggled to get by. There was one job where the refrigerators rolled by and I just put a sticker, the energy guide sticker that goes on there and just put it on. It was like, you're either going to do this for 20 more years or you're going to do something else. So, you know, and who would have thought smoothies would have worked. Just down Main Street, Walt McAllister opened a sandwich shop in the year that Maytag closed. His son Stephen is a local college student who runs a news website. As it became more and more real, I think the town got a little desperate trying to find anything to replace uh, the, the lack, the loss of jobs. I just, Still looking it, for just, manufacturing. In my generation in this town, is, there is no future for us here. And it doesn't seem like the city really cares because they don't really want to make one or won't, won't even listen to what we believe will make a town that we would want to stay in. Yeah, how does that make you feel? Oh, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. There's a myth that the loss of manufacturing was due entirely to international trade, and numerous politicians have capitalized on anger against foreign governments and workers. We're going to pursue new trade deals that create higher wages, and more opportunities for American workers, bringing back those magnificent words, 
made in the USA. The reality is that automation has also been a major factor. Manufacturing productivity is no longer directly tied to employment. Output is actually at an all-time high, only employment didn't follow. Around 2000, it fell off a cliff. That's automation, and those jobs won't ever come back. Some experts say automation has contributed to a decline in the U.S. labor force, now at 62.7% of the total population. So what would you say to towns that are looking out five years or looking out 10 years at this upheaval that's coming? What needs to happen? Well, don't make the mistake that McGill's murder made 14 years ago. Don't act like it's not coming. It's coming. What do you want your town to be like in 10 years without those jobs? Those jobs aren't going to exist. Back in Indianapolis, Kathleen works at the same plant that Brenda did. When you get through with it, if they get rid of middle class, it'll be a whole lot of poor people. It'll be way more poor people than it will be rich. So. Kathleen doesn't expect her job at Carrier to last much longer, and she's gotten involved in union work. She's currently uh, one of the top five officers in the local. I right now uh, run a union office at work. And she don't know when uh, her job will eventually play out, but pretty soon, pretty sure it's, it's going to. Yes. So the, the unknown. Yeah. Have you heard people that have found similar level jobs? I have not. I have not. And uh, definitely no jobs with the same amount of pay. A lot of people just, you know, mentally just like in shock about, you know, what their next move is going to be. You, know, you, you always want to remain optimistic on anything. And, and uh, with the, the situation as it is, there's not a lot of good paying jobs these people are going to be able to go to. And, uh, you know, for the most part, a lot of people's lives are ruined. So the thing that keeps me up at night is the fact that the people who will be most affected are kind of in the worst position to do something about it. Jess Chen is an expert on the potential effects of automation. We drove around Las Vegas and Jess pointed out neighborhoods that her research suggests are at the highest risk. And we find that Hispanics have a 25% higher chance of having their job automated than whites. And uh, African Americans have a 13% higher chance than whites of job automation. The first fully automated shuttle launched in Vegas last year. And it's not just driving. A diverse range of jobs could disappear throughout the city. Are we going to see social unrest? Um, and so there's not, not consensus in the industry about that. But I think there is greater agreement about what this means for inequality. Patrick Callahan runs a program for young people looking to get the necessary skills for technology jobs. You know, I think our responsibility, and I mean our responsibility as, as a society, is to retrain these folks for the jobs that are going to be there. Not the jobs that are always there today, but the jobs of the future. You can your slash S? There's a slash S. Does anyone truly want to be stuck in fast food their whole lives? Some of us don't get that option to change, and I'm glad this program gave me that option. Uh, which is why X Coffee doesn't actually work, which is why I was fooled. Tech Impact is funded by companies like Microsoft and Accenture, illustrating how tech companies recognize the need for retraining. All right, my name is Anthony Castellano. Um, I live here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I pretty much um, lived here all my life. Um, yeah, I graduated high school. And um, afterwards, um, I didn't really have a plan. Would you have been able to save the kind of money that you would need to get through something like this? Um, I, w I would say no. Ironically, Anthony's night job is as a janitor at a company that makes automated gaming machines like roulette and blackjack, games traditionally run by humans. They always have slot machines like wide open um, and all the wires are in there, all the motherboards, everything. It gives me kind of an encouragement to see, oh, okay, I could be working and with this instead of working with trash and if I um, keep doing well in school. So it's like since it's right there in my face, it's a really good a motivator. That question, the very motivation of work itself and the foundations of why we humans labor may be at risk. As some question how much labor there will actually be to go around. We can live in comfort and security. The trouble is we don't have jobs and therefore we lose our identity. We lose what we are. 
we lose our social stature. You have to have a social structure in which you earn money in return for something, because that's the way humans are motivated. Hey, I'm Joel with AJ+. Plus. Thanks for watching part two. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And if you liked this episode, don't forget to check out the other two.